Good morning. Good morning. Randy had stickers made. Take a sticker. It says, I love son of water. And when you take the sticker, put it somewhere where you'll see it. And every time you see it, pray for son of water. And please pray for my family, but pray for son of water. Because um, God wants to continue to reveal his will. And Satan would like nothing better than to stop the revelation of the will of God. So pray for Son of Water, pray for revival, pray for the revival of the body of Christ. Um, I don't know how many CDs and notes are back there left. Last week's went like hotcakes. I'm not sure what that means. Um, this is a continuation of, of what the Lord has been giving me uh, lately on the last days. And so uh, I just... Um, I really believe that God's giving me some, some just some great revelation. Um, I'm thankful. And uh, the Lord keeps changing. How many know that if you want to stay, um, I've told this story many times. Uh, Mariah Adder was probably the greatest female evangelist, bar none, that's ever lived. Uh, Mariah Adder lost five or six children. Um, when she was a young mother. She's just had so many terrible things that happened in her life. But the more terrible things that happened, the more the presence of God came on her life. And she became such a powerful um, evangelist. The multitudes were miraculously healed. Just like, just amazing miracles happened in her, her meetings. But she would pray for people. And you know how this was... Uh, a hundred years ago. And you know how when they pray for people and people would go down under the anointing of the Spirit? Well, this is when that was all new. And that didn't, you know, people do, I think there's a lot of courtesy dropping now, you know. But she had so much power on her ministry that she would pray and people miles away, miles away, would be knocked down off their feet under the power of the Holy Spirit. But they said the reason that she stayed is such uh, a prominent figure um, during those revival years was the fact that she continually flowed in change. Wherever God went, she would change, she would adapt, she would adjust. And her ministry was always adapting, always adjusting. And I think that's the key to success in this last day. There's gonna be a lot of things that God's gonna continue to change in our heart, the way we see, the way we think. And I believe that if we continue to adjust with God in this last day, then we're going to see the power of God uh, in the church in the last day. There are so many exciting things coming. So many exciting things. Um, <clears throat> and I have a lot of sermons written on, but I just eventually, hopefully, will get to them. This is called The Sound of Horses Running. Revelation 6. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering, and to conquer. So last week we looked at the rise of the power of the Antichrist, more it's the Antichrist spirit and not the person of the Antichrist. But the person of the Antichrist will be a man who at one point held a position of great power, but he will return to a position of even greater power. We talked about that last week, that this is the man or the spirit riding on this white horse. He's a returning conqueror. <clears throat> John writes that this can only take place Notice that he said, when the seals are open. He said, the seals will be open. The word seal in the Greek is that which fences in or blocks up all understanding. No matter what you believe you understand, there's room to continue to learn and to understand. My people are destroyed for their lack of understanding, Hosea said. How many know we need understanding in this last day? As the seals are open, Remember this, as the seals are opened, true understanding is given to the seeker, while deception 
or false understanding will increase in the ungodly. Remember what Paul prophesied in 2 Thessalonians 2. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, overwhelming delusion, an overcoming delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The separation between the righteous and the wicked is going to continue to increase relentlessly until Jesus comes to set up his kingdom. There's going to be a continual increase in division in the world between the godly and the ungodly. Look what Paul said in verse 7 again. He said, the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now lets, or in Paul's day, that word letteth means to withhold. He who now lets will let until he is taken out of the way. There's always been confusion over this verse. I've had people ask me about this verse because it contains a lot of confusion. How many know that it's the Father who withholds? How many know that God is in power and in control? God is the one who letteth or restrains by his spirit. Understand this. God's timing is always exact. It's not a second too soon. It's not a second too late. God's timing is always exact. When God, who is the director of the entire thing, shouts, action, the lamb will open the first seal, while at the same moment, the Antichrist is allowed by the Spirit to enter the scene. No matter how powerful the Antichrist might think he is, no matter how powerful the world might think the Antichrist is, the Antichrist still will only move as God allows him to move. God is the director of the entire thing. So why was the Antichrist spirit withheld? Look at 1 John 2 and 18. Little children, it's the last time. And as you've heard, that Antichrist shall come. Even now, there are many Antichrists whereby we know that is the last time. Remember when Jesus came to earth the first time, his coming was prophesied for literally thousands of years. Everybody knew the Messiah was coming. How many know the Jews still believe the Messiah is coming? They just missed it, right? Everybody knew for thousands of years that the Messiah was coming. Now the coming of the Antichrist mimics this. But the world stage had to be set to receive Jesus so that he could fulfill every messianic prophecy successfully. How many know that the Romans had to be in control before Jesus could come? How many know that the torture device called the cross had to be invented before Jesus Christ could come? How many know that the man had to be cursed? He had to be hanging on the tree for your sins and mine before the Messiah could step foot on the earth. The earth had to be prepared for his entrance. It's the same with Antichrist. The world's stage has to be set to receive Antichrist in order for God's plan for his rise and fall. Remember what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, for when in the time people are saying peace and safety, prosperity and security, suddenly, unexpectedly, like the onset of labor pains, 
destruction, ruin, punishment, and death will come upon the earth. This is reminiscent prophetically of another time that God did the exact same thing. Remember in Numbers 11, starting at verse 31. And there went forth a wind from the Lord and brought quails from the sea and let them fall by the camp as it were a day's journey on this side and a day's journey on the other side, round about the camp as it were two cubits high upon the face of the earth. And the people stood up all that day and all that night and all the next day and they gathered quail. And he that gathered least gathered ten homers. And they spread them all abroad for themselves all around about the camp. And while the flesh was yet between their teeth, ere it was chewed, before they had even a chance to begin to chew it, peace and security is finally here. The wrath of God was kindled against the people and the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. In the midst of their celebration, while the people were rejoicing and reveling in their season of prosperity and security, unexpected punishment and death came. Now you gotta understand something. This is a terrifying way of God. When sinful and ungodly people appear to be being greatly prospered and secure, Look out. Remember, someone put the cheese in that trap for that very purpose. Look what Jesus said in Mark 13. But of that day and that hour knows no man. How many know? No man knows. Not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son but the Father. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for you know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants, to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for you know not when the master of the house comes, at evening, or at midnight, at the cock crowing, or in the morning. Lest coming suddenly, he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. The job of the porter is to notice the times. He said, I told the porters to watch. Did you notice that? The job of the porter is to watch for clues of his coming. That's the job of the porter. The porter is the one who walks in the prophetic, who sees and warns the people that the day is at hand. Let me ask you this question. How many tend to be procrastinators? (laughs) At least there are truthful people here. I like that. A procrastinator knows what needs to be done, but you always find a reason for not doing it now. Isn't that true? A friend of mine said that one time. He said, what's a procrastinator, Dan? I said, I'll tell you later. (laughs) Jesus uses the word watch. How many noticed that in verse 37? The word watch is the Greek word, and it means stay awake, be vigilant, and be alert. The word vigilant in the Cambridge English Dictionary is be very careful to notice signs of danger. Vigilant. Jesus was saying here, be very careful to notice the signs of the time. It has to do with being diligent. Let me ask you this question. If you knew for a fact that Jesus would return in the month of October. How many would fast more? How many would pray more? How many would sleep less? How many would seek entertainment less? How many would be crying out in contrition and mercy and pardon for your life 
and for the people that you love. If you knew for a fact that Jesus was going to come before the end of this month, how many would be crying out to God continually for mercy upon your life and those you love? How many, on the other hand, if you knew for a fact that Jesus would return on October 28th, how many would live it up until the 27th? That's a procrastinator's way. Right after the Jesus movement of the late 60s and early 70s, there came a season of the awareness of the return of Christ. How many remember that time? Maybe a lot of you don't, some of you do. In that day and in that time, we were continually reminded that the return of Jesus was imminent. There were so many songs that were being sung about the return of Christ. I heard so many groups, the Gaithers would sing about the return of Christ. And and there were many of the gospel singers that were continually singing about the day when I finally see Jesus and him coming in the clouds to receive us. There was a, his return was imminent, felt imminent. There was in the air a feeling of expectation. How many could remember that? This feeling of expectation. Jesus said these words in such an hour that you think not the Son of Man comes. How many don't think he's coming today? that gives an even greater opportunity for him to come. Because he said, it's in such an hour that you think not that he will come. How many know when the time is that you think not? How many know that every day there is a time when you think not? It's when you're asleep. He said, watch, because when you're asleep, I'm coming. When you let down your guard, when you're no longer looking for the signs of the times, I'm coming in that day. Spiritually asleep people are carnally awake people. Carnally awake people are continually highly aware of things that are going on in the natural realm. People say to me, did you hear about this? I say, no, unless somebody told me I don't hear about this. How many know in the season that we live in, it's hard not to be distracted? How many want to just barely make it into God's kingdom? How many would rather have Jesus find you waiting? Isn't it better to be at the hospital early than to have the baby delivered in the car on the way? Right? So in Revelation 6, the Lamb begins to open the seals. Let's look at that one more time. Revelation 6, 1 and 2. And I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. And I saw and behold a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. So again, the Antichrist spirit comes onto the world stage. He's a person, but he's not known as the person yet. I'm sure he probably doesn't even realize who he is yet. But the spirit of Antichrist is heavily upon him. And the spirit of Antichrist is working to put him into the position where he will reign as that short-term Antichrist. You've got to remember something about the Antichrist. He is the son of Satan. He's the archetype of Christ. Do you know what an archetype is? It's the imitation of the original. He's an archetype of Christ. Antichrist himself is not yet unmasked for the world The Bible says, but he comes possessing a crown. He's sitting on a white horse with a bow and a crown. Now crown, like we talked about last week, again, in the Greek is the word Stephanos, which has to do with a military victory. But also the crown has another meaning. 
even as a weapon itself. <clears throat> in, the, in Satanism and in witchcraft, and I didn't realize this, but the language of choice spoken in the black masses and satanic rituals is Latin. Did anybody know that? Maybe somebody knew that. Justin, you know. It's Latin. They speak Latin in their rituals. Now here in Revelation 6, we see the Antichrist spirit riding his white horse as a returning conqueror around the globe. Remember, he's going forth to conquer and he's conquering. Remember that. It's not merely an American attack. This is a global attack by the Antichrist spirit. John says again that he's given a crown, and this crown will help propel him into the position of his newfound authority. This crown was given to him as a weapon to propel him into his position. The word given is the Greek word didomi, and it means to shake hands or to make a deal for it. So the crown that he possesses is a conquering weapon that some other source has manufactured for him. In the language of the Satanists, the Latin word for crown is corona. Just saying, somebody needs to look for the signs. Weirdly enough, and this was from a secular blog that I found this, the word defined as virus comes from the Latin originally meaning the venom of a serpent. The poison of Satan. Oh, Dan, that's just too plain. It can't be that. Okay, the Messiah is going to be born in a manger. Dan, that baby's in a manger. That can't be him. It's got to be angels and trumpets and things like that, right? You've got to look for the signs. You've got to study the signs. Stay awake. There's signs. The reason for the name corona or crown virus is that the virus itself under a microscope is shaped like a many-horned crown. Now, here's a side note that I found this week and I found extremely amazing, shocking maybe. The Roman emperors, how many remember the, the, the crown that the Roman emperors would wear? How many remember seeing the picture of the, the, it looked like garland or leaves or something? Remember? Does anybody remember that picture? That crown is called the Corona Civica. The Corona Civica, which was symbolic of politically saving the empire. This all gets so deep. Google this. Promise me you'll go home and Google this, okay? Google World Health Organization and look at the symbol of the World Health Organization. How many know the World Health Organization? They're the ones pushing to control the world right now with their... Look, Google the World Health Organization. Look at the symbol for the World Health Organization. It's the Corona Civica, which was worn by the Roman emperors. It's the crown. He was given a crown. Too plain, Dan. This can't be real. It is. Maybe I should have hid this one on YouTube, too. We get more views when it's hidden. People are curious. I believe that this white horse, which has successfully navigated the entire globe is the first door opened that's been opened to bring about a series of open doors. How many know once the doors start opening, they don't just shut and we say, let's start over. These open doors will lead to a massive global power struggle. Revelation 6, 3 and 4. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. And there went out another horse, and he was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. 
I believe that we're seeing the beginning of the ride of the red horse. The Bible says that his influence is to take peace. To take peace. The word take means, uh, it's the Greek word lambano, and it means to completely remove peace from the earth, from the natural realm. The word peace means prosperity and rest. We're on the verge of something. I have so many things that I could tell you. I have so many things, but I, I got to stick with the program. We're on the verge of something happening very soon that's going to change everything to something that it's never been before. Now, I'm not sure of the length of each of these global rides. How many know that Revelation is written in symbols? And there's so much in each symbol that you could spend a long time on each one. But they're all symbolic. But God doesn't tell us how much, how long the length of each of these global rides of these horsemen is. But I believe that the white horse may continue to ride until the end, increasing uh, exponentially even. I'm, I'm sure it'll be part of the plague, the diseases of the last day. I'm sure it will. But how many understand that people lose interest very, fairly quickly? How many know that people just aren't as desperate about the corona as they were last year? Reminds you of like Pharaoh and the Egyptians, doesn't it? People lose interest uh, fairly quickly, just like Pharaoh and the Egyptians did during their tribulation period. And although you may slow men's pursuit of pleasure temporarily, they won't be stopped by one little virus because they're desperate. But understand this, it's literally not about the virus. It has nothing actually to do with the virus itself. It's about the ever-tightening noose of control by the Antichrist, by the spirit of Antichrist. That Antichrist spirit is working to enthrone their Christ, which is Satan, their Messiah. So the, all of a sudden the noose continues to tighten and men feel the tightening grip of control. So I would ask you, when men feel controlled, what do they do? They resist. Isn't that true? The spirit of freedom born within every man, woman, and child. When they feel controlled, they resist. And peace will slowly be removed from the earth. The Bible says that the next step created by the red horsemen is that men begin to kill one another. The word to kill one another means to move violently against each other in the beginning to the eventual slaughtering of humanity. We're seeing this in places around the world where citizens have already been disarmed and during protests are being treated violently. Where in countries they're taking their children away from them, putting them in in stadiums and vaccinating them when the parents have no say so whatsoever. Why? Because they're not armed. They have no way to say no. This is going to continue to escalate. Here in verse 4, the Antichrist movement is given, the Bible says, a great sword. Remember at this point, it's behind the scenes influence of the Antichrist spirit rather than the actual person called Antichrist. All these things will begin to happen in steps. One thing will open the door to the next thing. John writes here in verse 4 that the Antichrist spirit will be given a great sword. This translates as the ability to cause fighting and controversy, which will be seen, uh, the word is defined as, Heated public opposition. There will be great riots. There will be great... How many understand that great protests, if they're not heard, turn into great riots and great violence? The great sword is also defined as the ability to create wars. Now listen, I've heard many prophets predict that the second American Civil War is coming. This is actually predicted in Scripture that there will be an, another war here. I was telling some friends of mine yesterday that George Washington actually was given a vision by an angel that came and spoke to him at Valley Forge. 
the angel came and he told him there would be three great events that would take place in the United States. He said the first event would be George Washington was a man of God. George Washington was an amazing man, prophesied over, an amazing man of God. I was telling the story of how the, the, the Indians were determined to kill George Washington because he was a great warrior and they saw him as that. They said he fights like we do. He doesn't fight like the British, he fights like we do. So the chief, this great chief, had told his men, make sure you kill that great white general. They couldn't kill him. Years later, this chief saw George Washington in a camp and he walked over to him and he said, the God of heaven protects you. He said, I told all of my warriors to aim it to kill you. He said, my own gun, which has never missed, I, with it, I fired 17 times at you. He said, and he prophesied, you cannot be killed by a bullet. They said because of that prophecy, George Washington took that as a sign from God. He was never wounded by a bullet. In all the years, they said he would stand in an open battlefield, encouraging his men to bravery. And against all odds, a ragtag volunteer American army beat the greatest British army that was ever assembled on the earth. Because God had prophesied over this man that he couldn't die. He had four holes shot through his jacket. Two horses shot out from under him. A cannonball hit the ground so close in front of him, it threw dirt in his face, but he survived. He was a great man of God. And the Lord visited him with an angel at Valley Forge. And he told George Washington there will be three great events that happened in these United States. He said, the first one is the Revolutionary War that you're involved in right now. He said, you will struggle and you will overcome and you will win your freedom. He said, the second one will be called the Great Civil War, the Great American Civil War. And it will come as a reason for, because of disunity. He said, this great civil war will come, but he said, out of it. He said, remember, you're brothers. But out of it, he said, this war will come a great unity, and it will become the greatest nation on earth. But he said, the third event will be the worst event in history for this nation. He said, the third event will be another great war that will come to this nation. In the last days, there'll be another great war that comes to this nation. Now, it could be another civil war. The Bible isn't specific, but there will be a war that comes to the United States. It may be a civil war, it may not. I believe myself, and I could be wrong, but I believe that the unrest caused by the taking of peace by the red horse rider that will cause there to become an invasion into the United States. And I believe that the invasion force will probably be UN troops, which will be sent to disarm Americans by attempting to create martial law. But the angel prophesied that America would again overcome. I don't believe that they're gonna succeed. I believe that America will overcome. But I do believe that they will succeed in removing America from being the global force that she is now. I actually saw this many years ago in my spirit when I was a young evangelist. This has to occur for Gog and Magog to come against the land of Israel unopposed. This is all part of the plan of God. Look at Revelation 6, 5 and 6. When he had opened a third seal, I heard the third beast say, come and see. And I beheld and look, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny. See that you hurt not the oil and the wine. John says, and I saw famine and great lack. How many were hoping that this would be after the rapture? Sorry, this isn't. These days are coming. 
The Lord spoke to me several weeks ago. And he said this to me. My people have become gluttonous and overindulgent. He said, when I return for my bride, she will be humbled before me. For many years, most of the church in America has believed in a pre-tribulation rapture where Christians are taken from the earth before things get bad. Christians believe that it's God's will that they remain absolutely comfortable until the end. How many know that it's easy to trust God when the shelves are filled? But what happens to your faith when every outside source is removed? Will you, like the rest of the world, revert to increasing panic? Or will you continue to seek the kingdom without fear? The Bible says the day of the Lord will come with fire. The fire will bring, bring destruction to the wicked, but it will purify the godly. How many understand that when God warns us and we continue to ignore the warning, at that point God is forced to act? How many ever had a child and you say, I'm, I'm telling you, knock it off. I'm telling you, knock it off. I'm telling you, you're not a good parent. If at the end of three, I'm telling you, knock it off, you don't give him a, something to remember it by. Is it true? Once God begins, he won't stop until he's finished. We've ignored the warnings. We've ignored them. And at this point, nothing can stop it. Nothing. You can pray, you can cry out, you can do anything. There's nothing that can stop it at the point we're at now. We've gone too far. Remember what God told Solomon in 2 Chronicles 7. If I shut up the heaven and there's no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, and I'll heal their land. Why would God shut up the heavens so that famine would come? Solomon says in 2 Chronicles chapter 6 that it's because God's people offend him. That's what Solomon said. When God's people offend him, God shuts up the heavens. I believe that the lukewarm nature of the modern gluttonous church has offended God. The heavens were shut up spiritually. But because the church didn't even notice, God's going to bring dearth to the natural realm. I heard a preacher say that once. He said, we're going to have a good time here this morning. Regardless if the Lord shows up or not, we're still going to have a good time. That's become kind of the, the thought process. We have so much entertainment value now in the church. How many understand that, that lack in the spiritual realm may go unnoticed by the majority? But lack in the natural realm will be noticed by all. How many know God can withdraw his spirit from you and you may not even notice? You may not even notice. You might continue to say, I am so thankful I am a Christian, I'm going to heaven. You may not even notice that the spirit of God has been withdrawn. But when God punishes and he withdraws food from the shelves, every person will notice. Isn't that sad? Lack in the natural will be noticed by all. Think about it. You don't have to answer this because I wouldn't. How many would choose spiritual hunger over natural hunger? Given the choice, how many would choose to starve spiritually rather than starve naturally? So God told Solomon, if my people will humble themselves, the word means fast. If my people will fast and pray. Prayer has to do with intercession, or as Jesus called it in Revelation chapter 3, zealous repentance. How many understand that God will give you the choice to do what's right? 
But when we don't respond, because he's merciful, he forces us to do it. How many times in the Old Testament, God's prophets would warn his people, but the people didn't want to hear the warnings because it made them feel uncomfortable. So what would the people do? They would listen to false prophets who tell them that all's well. Remember Jeremiah saying, you need to, you need to give up right now or the king of Babylon is going to come in and kill everyone. And the false prophets were all saying, nah, it's going to be all right. It's fine. They listen to the false prophets and what happens? Judgment comes unexpectedly without warning. How many understand that God's judgments almost always include famine? Look at verses 5 and 6 in Revelation again. And when he had looked, and when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see, and I beheld, and look, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny. But see that you don't hurt the oil and the wine. There's so much in here that I, I'd like to get into, but I can't. How many know if people panicked over the lack of toilet paper, how do you suppose they'll act when there's no food? Do you remember how people panicked over the lack of toilet paper? How do you suppose they're going to act when there's literally no food? That Revelation already tells us it's coming. You can't even begin to imagine the fear and the violence that will come as a result of an actual American hunger situation. Will you panic or will you trust? I just saw Perry Stone do a YouTube video, this was a couple weeks ago, on all the things that are all of a sudden disappearing from all the shelves in America. They're slowly being removed from the shelves in America. Since the 70s, I've heard that the day would come when a piece of bread would cost a bag of gold. How many remember hearing that? Here John saw a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. What does that mean? A meager meal, literally survival rations, will cost one person an entire day's labor. So every person in that entire family, it would cost them, if they all labored an entire day, they would get one survival ration. That's, what it, that's the prize. Look at verses 7 and 8. I want to close this up. I have so much, but I've got to close. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death. And hell followed with him. And power was given unto him over a fourth part of the earth to kill with a sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. This is a terrifying, and I'm, I'm, I don't do it justice, I don't go into it enough. This is such a terrifying verse. But in closing, this fourth horseman is called pale in English. How many notice that? There it's translated pale. The original Greek is chloros, chloros, which is translated green. Chloros is the, is the root word for chlorophyll. That's the pigment that makes plants green. Chlorophyll. And so you look for, why would he call this pale horse chloros? The, the flag, the national flag for Islam is green. This is what he's talking about. Fourth of the earth is going to be taken over by Islam. Islam. There will soon come a massive move of, of demonically driven, radical Muslims. John said that death came and hell accompanied it. What does that mean? Angry, radical Islam, you will see this happen, will rule over a quarter of the globe. It's just almost unimaginable, prophesied here. Multitudes of millions, multitudes of millions and millions, probably in the billions, will be forced to convert to Islam or die. If they convert to save their lives, hell will unavoidably become their final destination. That's why he said hell follows them. These four horsemen have ridden as a type over the last 2,000 years. But this type is fulfilled in the last day. Everything in Scripture works like that. 
You see a type and you say, yeah, you know, we, we've seen, you know, the white horse ride. We've seen the black horse ride. We've seen the red horse. We've seen the, the pale green horse. We've seen the Islam. Absolutely, you have. But they all have ridden as a type. But in this last day, you're going to see the reality of it all consecutively at the same time. And the world is going to become a very chaotic place. Next week, I'm going to preach on the great revival that's going to come because of this. One of the most amazing things. I could preach for a month on the revival that's going to come because of this. It's amazing. But I want you to know, God never gives us warnings to bring fear. He always gives us warnings that we might seek Him and find hope. That's why he warns the church. The only ones that should be afraid are those who don't know God and don't seek God. Not you. You've already been chosen. You've already been picked. He already loves you. Carol sang that song this morning about how deep the Father's love is for you. And you sang it like you believed it. So if you believe it and you know he loves you, you've got to believe that Fathers take care of children. But children need to trust their God. And they need to line up with the command. He said you need to fast and pray. Now it's not for your nation because he's not going to heal the nation. The nation's gone too far. But he will heal your families. He'll restore your children. He'll bring your life and the lives of those close to you back to him. And in that place, you'll find that in that secret place, a greater love, a greater relationship, a greater trust than you've ever found with God before in your life. I promise you this. You will experience the greatest experience of God in your life than has ever been seen on the earth during this last time. It will be a time of the greatest fear and panic in the world. But it'll be the, also the time of the greatest rejoicing and victory for the body of Christ. Will there be Christians die? There will. There will. Multitudes. Millions. Why? Because they won't hear. We need to hear in this last day. Christians that die will die needlessly. And the reason they'll die is how many understand that there were people that didn't go to work during 9-11? Because the Lord told them, don't go into the trade centers. How many know there were a lot of people new in their spirits that died in that building? That they shouldn't have been there. There were people that got out, that God got out. In this last day, it'll be the same way. There'll be believers that die. Which, you know, is still a win-win situation, right? Go to be with God. But they don't have to. They could stay and be here for the greatest revival and spiritual awakening that the globe has ever seen. Begin to cry out to God. Begin. I would, even as a porter who watches somebody on the wall crying out, I would advise you, implore you, begin to fast and pray and begin to seek your God. Begin to cry out to God for your life and for the life of your family. And for those that you love. And you'll see great victory in this last time. Amen. Stand with me if you would.